You know, I say every, every Sunday, I'm not gonna sing. And it's not because I don't like singing, I love singing. It's what I did before I came here as a worship leader. And I know I have to like save, I have to save my voice, right? Because I do this three times. There's no chance I'm not, not singing today. I'm telling you, music is so good. Don't think, by the way, don't think for a second that the sermon starts when the pastor just starts preaching. Like the, the message, the songs that we've declared as a community, my goodness, so good, so good, right? I am, uh, I am so glad you were here. Welcome into this place today. You know, if, if I could, um, if I could like, I don't know, tell you some of the top questions as a pastor that, that I get, there, there would be a couple that I would say, well, I get these questions a lot. Uh, one of them is, why, why do bad things happen to good people? Has anyone ever wondered that before? Or, or how about this? This is a real one. Um, why, why, why does evil exist in the world, right? Or this one. Someone real serious in a coffee shop came up to me, and they, it's true. They said, pastor. And I'm thinking, okay, it's evil. Why do bad things happen? They're like, no, Leviticus. Like, what do I do with Leviticus? I just don't. So I have great news for you, and truly, we're excited because we're starting a new series today called Long Story Short. If you have ever read the Bible, and there are pieces that you just go, what is that even about? Or maybe, maybe in your faith, there is a season of your life that you just look at the Old Testament, and you look at the New Testament, and you're just trying to put them together, and they don't fit. I shared this. Some of you love this, but truly, this is just where a lot of my life growing up, this is kind of where I fell in the Old Testament, New Testament spectrum. Old Testament, God cranky, a little bit on the edge. New Testament, God had kids, mellowed out, kinder, softer God. That's what I used to think. <laughs> and you know, I shared that in seminary, and I'm so thankful for the professor who said, listen, that's terrible theology. Don't ever tell that to anyone. And here I am saying it out loud, but I will tell you, that is not an accurate perspective of the word, of what God is doing. Don't think of it as two different books, but think of it as one continuous story, I've said this, of, of God pursuing the heart of his creation. So that's why when I, when, I found, when I found this resource last year and our team and our planning retreat in October, we talked about, all right, how do we, how do we wanna start 2019? I love that we're landing here. Because in this series, it's based off of a book written by a theologian, by a scholar named Joshua McNall. There's copies in our bookstore. Several have asked. We're even going to sell copies of this. It's on a table outside. But I love this guy. Number one, he's got a great sense of humor. Number two, he writes in such a way that it's not over your head. And this ADHD person, I need that in my life. So he wrote it for people for two reasons. Number one, so you could just sort of get a picture as to what's going on here. So he takes it in six movements, and this is, this is where we're gonna be taking you over the next six weeks. He walks you through just creation. Next week, we're gonna talk about the fall, that's Genesis chapter three. And then we're gonna talk about Israel, just what is God doing in the Old Testament? What is going on there? And then the last three weeks of the series, we move into the New Testament. So we'll talk about Jesus. We'll talk about the church. What is the role of the church today? And we land with the new creation. I don't know if you know this, but the Bible begins in the garden. We're not there yet. But in Revelation, spoiler alert, it ends back in the garden. So our prayer for you, and we have, we've been praying over you, we pray over these seats, we pray over those who are live streaming, that you would just have, Susan's word, well, it's a liturgical word, an epiphany, that you would just have this realization over the next six weeks of, oh my goodness, this makes sense, like, I get what's going on, and then here's the total win for me, for us as a team, if someone were to ever come up to you, be prepared for this, and they were to take a Bible and they were to set it down in front of you and say, hey, could you just explain this to me? <laughs> Your first reaction right now might be, yeah, hold on. And you're just gone. Like, you don't even want to answer the question. How do the camera guys do, by the way? Did they keep up with it? I didn't look. <laughs> right? So rather than run away or duck the question, I'm pretty fast, by the way. I don't want to brag about myself, but I got some speed. My tail is tucked in. What's going on? Hold on, let me just, 
What's, what's the matter? Oh, okay. Is it good now? I'm going to tell a story on Susan. Sometimes my jacket gets tucked in. And there was one time I looked over and Susan was just doing this. I didn't say a thing. I'm just saying it confused me. I didn't quite know what was going on over there. In section number one. All right. So, oh man, you are never, I'm so sorry. Okay, let's pray. Is this live stream? This is the one that goes live right now. People around the world are watching. Thanks, let's pray. God, we, um, Father, we are so grateful for who you are. <laughs> you are, you're beautiful, Lord. And, and the God of the universe, it still, it takes my breath away when I just stop and I just think that you, Lord, you're here, you're here. And this story, the story that we're gonna spend time over the next six weeks, the story that we're gonna be talking about, Lord, this is our story. We are at the heart of this story because this story is about us and it's about a God, a creator, the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit who breathed life into us, who breathed purpose into us and you've called us to play a role in this story. So Lord, as we begin this journey, as we begin this trip through scripture, God, I pray that there are just light bulbs that would go off. Father, I pray that we would just grow spiritually. We would grow deep roots in who you are and what you're doing. But Lord, I also pray that we would be the very lights to humanity, that Father, we could reflect the story, the goodness of this story, the love that's found in this story, and we can just share it with those, Lord, that we come in contact with for what you've done for what you're doing, and Lord, for what you have in store, for what you have planned, I give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor, and it's in your name that we say amen, amen. Sometimes the answers that you're looking for, you find them in the most unexpected places. Let me say that one more time, because that's an important thing I want us to get this morning. Sometimes the, the things that you're seeking, the things that you're looking for, you find those things in the most unexpected places. You know, I've said that I, I lose things a lot. I'm a little bit forgetful. I'm thankful for that little tile GPS tracker that's on my keychain. I lose my keys all the time. That has helped me out tremendously. I'm thrilled to be able to say that here I am at 47 years of age. I never lost my kids when they were little. I'm so thrilled about that. There was one time, I don't know that my wife knows this, I was... It was daddy duty day and I was taking care of my little boy Nick and he was in the buggy and we were grocery shopping together at a Kroger. And you know the place where you return your carts? Well, I had pushed him up, he's sitting there, and I unloaded the groceries. They were right next to the return cart buggy thing. And I unload the groceries, I get in the car, I seat belt up, I put it in reverse and in the passenger side window, there's my little boy waving, <laughs> still in the buggy. I just kind of laughed and ha <laughs> just kidding. He doesn't remember. God gifts little kids with not remembering those things. <laughs> but I was captivated by a story. Talk about lost things being found. It happened over Christmas. Maybe you saw it. It's this woman who bought an Instant Pot from, Wal from Walmart. She, she got this, she got, gave herself a, a Christmas gift and, and she, she bought this Instant Pot and she opens it up and as she goes inside, inside the Instant Pot is wedding ring. It was a wedding ring inside the Instapot. Strangest story in the world, right? And she's looking at this thing, and I mean, it's, it's, it's got a story. There's a, an engagement band and a wedding ring, and you could tell it had been worn, so she didn't, she didn't know what to do. She knew this clearly belonged to someone, had no idea what it was about, so of course, she goes to the internet. And she takes a picture of the Instapot, she takes a picture of the ring, and she just starts to say, hey, listen, I don't know if anyone was shopping at this particular Walmart, or if you've lost a wedding ring, or if an Instapot somewhere is inside your story, but I have a wedding ring. Now, this begins to get shared, and it goes viral. There is another woman, same city, of course, and she had lost her wedding ring at a Walmart. And what had happened was, she had gone into the Walmart, she had looked, she had sort of pondered, do I wanna buy this? She takes this Instapot off the shelf and she unpacks it because she just wants to see what it is. She wants to look at it and as she does, without her knowing, her wedding ring falls inside. Well, she packs it back up and she puts it back on the shelf. Now, she said, I knew when I got back to my car, the wedding ring was somewhere on the property of Walmart. 
And she spent so much time going over the parking lot, walking up and down the aisles. But on Christmas Day, she connected with this lady and she got her wedding ring back. And the thing that, the thing that struck me was she said, you know, there were a lot of places this thing could have been, but the one place I never expected it was inside that Instapot. Sometimes the answers that you're looking for are in the most unexpected places. And that's why today to talk about creation, Genesis 1 and 2, go with me for just a minute, to the book of Job. Will you open to Job? I want to go to Job chapter 38 because Job finds an answer to a question that he's been asking and I guarantee you the answer that God gave him was not a place that he expected God to go. So we're Job 38, and then we're gonna bounce back to Genesis 1 and 2. Now, I gotta tell you a little bit of Job's story. Actually, Job, fun trivia fact for you, is the oldest book in the Bible. It is the oldest book dated in the Bible. Job is the story of a man, if you start in Job chapter 1, you're like, Job's got it all together. I mean, he has a lot of wealth, he's got a lot of possessions, he's got a good family, and most importantly, of all the people, Job is one of the most righteous, one of the most upright, one of the most closest to God. You read that and you go, that's a pretty good life. But very quickly, and I do mean very quickly in the story, things begin to go downhill very fast. Job loses a lot of his possessions, there's a fire, he loses all of his livestock, he loses his wealth. There is this gust of wind and all of his family had gathered together and the walls blow down. He loses his entire family in a freak accident. He loses his wealth, he loses his finances, he loses all that he has, he loses his family and then he has a personal affliction. He develops some sort of, it's a little like leprosy. There are boils that develop on Job. And the only way that he can find relief from the affliction that he has is to sit in ashes, to break a clay jar, and to scratch himself with the shards of pottery. Now, if you're ever gathered around a water cooler, and you're just talking about how bad things are, oh, you wouldn't believe I asked for non-fat milk in my latte. They gave me whole milk. No! If Job is there and he tells you that boil story, he's going to win every single time, right? Like Job has it rough. And he enters, rightfully so, into this season of, hello, God, are you there People begin to just sort of come in and have conversations. You know, sometimes when people are grieving or when they're hurting or when they're afflicted, we want to say things to help. Job's wife, Exhibit A, comes in and her words of encouragement are, you know, you really should just curse God and die. Okay, see ya. Great candidates for re-engage the marriage ministry here at the Woodlands United Methodist Church, meeting every Tuesday, 6.30 in this space. Curse God and die, really? Well, she moves on. And then enter into the scene, Job has these three friends, and, and I mean, you can read it, it's 37 chapters, and they're not short chapters, 37 chapters of, of just wrestling and struggling, and just, Job is in a place where the world is upside down. He's in a place where he feels like he's done everything right when it comes to following God, but everything wrong in his life is happening. Have you ever been there? Do you ever just, just look at the world and just think, this is not the way it was supposed to be? This is not the way that it's supposed to be. And I love, I love this. This surprised me this week. I love chapter 38. Because a lot of people have been talking, a lot of people have been trying to encourage, a lot of questions have been asked. But in verse 38, what changes in the story is God speaks. Pay attention. Job 38, verse 1, then the Lord spoke to Job. This is in the original Hebrew text, Y-H-W-H, eh, he, the, he. This is Yahweh, the God who spoke to Moses out of the burning bush, the very same who talked to Abraham, is the very same who speaks to Job, and he talked to Job out of what? The storm. He talked to Job out of the storm, out of the chaos, out of everything that was swirling in his life. Listen, some of you, maybe this moment you were in a storm. Don't mistake God's silence 
for his absence. Because it's actually, Oswald Chambers said, when, when man, when we stand up against the hardest of trials and the hardest of times, it's really the face of God that we're looking at in those moments because God is never distant from our storms. And it's here when Job has all of these questions that the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm and he said this, who is it that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Verse three, brace yourself like a man. <laughs> I love this. You know what the original text says? God says to Job, gird up thy loins. Okay, come on. <laughs> you know it's getting real when God says to you, gird up thy loins. I love that. <laughs> that was free. Who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man, Job, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. And listen to where he goes. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimension? Surely you know, Job. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all of the angels shouted for joy? God takes Job back to creation. Sometimes the answers that you're looking for are in the strangest places. God goes on and begins to just talk about the creatures and breathing the stars into existence and where everything began because sometimes you have to look back to the beginning of the story to find the hope in today and to see how the story is going to end. I love it. I never thought about this before. I mean, even in Matthew chapter six, when you, when you read the Sermon on the Mount and you know, if anyone else kind of struggles with anxiety or, or worry, and a lot of times you just get overwhelmed and you feel like everything is pressing down on you, I could almost recite Matthew 6 to heart because Jesus talks about worry. He talks about anxiety. He's looking at a people who feel as if their world is upside down and everything is going wrong and they just don't know how they're gonna move and what does Jesus do? He points to the birds of the air and he points to the lilies of the field. And he says, if your heavenly father takes care of them, how much more are you than they? Is it possible that even here in Matthew 6, what Jesus is doing is he is taking people back to creation to say, this is not where it all began. I mean, the verse in Job, the one that caught me off guard that I just didn't think was when God said, were, were you there when its footings were set or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and the angels shouted for joy? Think about in the beginning, in the creation story, it began. I mean, we say big bang sometimes, but maybe it's more like a big disco or a big rave. It was a big party with angels shouting. Did you ever just feel like, here's how the story began. God, who looks a lot like Morgan Freeman or Gandalf the Grey, is sitting on a rock by himself. He's been playing solitaire for about a billion years and sounding a lot like Eeyore goes, well, this is boring, and has to do something different. It's almost like he was just bored with what was going on and, well, maybe I'll try something else. That's not the creation story. In fact, Josh McDowell in chapter one, I love that he said this. Let me read this to you. He said, the story of creation is not the tale of a lonely deity looking for companionship. God wasn't gloomily reading the personal ads when he, cre when he crafted the galaxies. Creation is not the tale of a friendless old man who made the universe because he needed some people to talk to this. Creation is the story of an artist effortlessly sculpting the universe amidst a chorus of thankful celebration. The universe was born amidst a party, singing stars, angels, shouting. It was creation from community. That's where it began. God 
takes Job back to the beginning to say, look, you got to look back to find the hope in today and to know that the story is not over yet. It began from community. In the beginning, Genesis 1-1, God. Yes, God was there in the beginning. But how about John 1-1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1-2, Jesus was with God in the beginning. God wasn't alone. John is just trying to say it's hard. Wrap your mind around the truth that in the beginning it wasn't just the Father, but it was also the Son. Jesus was there in the very beginning, community. The Father, the Son. Where's the Holy Spirit? You know, for the longest time, I used to think the Holy Spirit sort of entered the scene in Pentecost, right? Like that's when the Spirit makes the Spirit, the Holy Spirit's appearance. But is it possible, Genesis 1-2, not just in the beginning was God who created the heavens and the earth, but this, Genesis 1-2, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and who? The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. I love that. The spirit, the ruha, the pneuma, the spirit, the Holy Spirit. Even when everything was dark, there's the Holy Spirit weaving, floating, moving, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Genesis chapter one moves through this beautiful rhythm. Spend some time in Genesis one and two this week. Genesis chapter one, you find these two things. You find things are formed, and then you find things are filled. The galaxies are formed. God fills them with planets, suns, stars. You find the earth is formed, and God fills the earth, animals, vegetation. You find the seas are formed, and God fills fills the seas with sea creatures. And over and over and over, pay attention to this, as God, as the three in one, as they're weaving, as they're creating, you see this phrase, it is good, it is good, it is good. It's there six times. But then God creates us, creates mankind in his image. And for the first time, the verbiage changes and it moves to not just it is good, but it is good. Very good. And then there is a seventh day. Don't forget the seventh day where God presses pause. Don't forget the seventh day where God chooses to rest. And it's not because playing solitaire for a billion years is exhausting. It's not because the creator, the almighty, was out of shape and just couldn't keep up with his pace. It's because God knew that sometimes it's just as important Work is sacred, but stopping and taking a stroll through creation and just breathing is equally as important. That's Genesis 1. Born from community. It was to God's delight to create this and to bring us into the world. You know, I I think, um, you're just gonna have to forgive me, but this is just how I think. Can we talk Star Wars for just a second? You know, every time I watch these movies, and I know episode nine's coming out this year and everyone's gonna hate it and I'm gonna love it. That's just the way it is. But you know, I sit there. I've always been a fan and I have this moment and I know it's coming. You know, you go in, you watch a Star Wars movie. Everything's dark. There's stars. And this is a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And you know John Williams and the orchestra is about to kick it. You know. And it scares me half to death, right? Think of Genesis 1. Forgive me, but I'm going here. That's the overture. That's the grand beginning. Genesis chapter 1. And the scroll comes, and on day 1, and it's just this beautiful overture story of a greater thing that God is doing. But when that little beginning to those Star Wars movies end, when the font, when the screen just kind of disappears, what happens? The camera goes... And it comes down and it's like, okay, now we're moving in. That's Genesis chapter two. Because all of a sudden in Genesis chapter two, you've moved away from this grand story and you zone in, you focus in on mankind. And all of these verses 
It is good. It is good. It is good. Here's the first time you see this written in scripture. It is not good. You know what it is? It is not good for man to be alone. The first thing that God says, no, this isn't right, was isolation, was us being alone. So what does God do? God gives man a helper. He places woman in the story. And Genesis chapter two, the end of the creation story, which is where we are today, is this picture. Adam and Eve, Dwelling in the garden, this good and perfect place, they are dwelling in relationship with their creator, walking with him, talking with him, seeing themselves, trusting that God is going to meet their every need. And the last verse, I think it's Genesis 2.25, I was just, don't you wish the story could end here? The last verse of the creation story is this, and Adam and Eve lived in the garden, dwelled with God, they were naked, they saw everything about one another, and they felt no shame. That's where the story ends. Mankind living in the garden, dwelling with their creator in full relationship with God, so fully invested, so fully trusting that shame was never a part of the creation story. It was never God's intent for the creation story. There are so many other creation stories that are out there, different cultures that adapted so many, but what sets the Christian story apart is there's no conflict in the midst of creation in Genesis 1 and 2, none. It ends with, and Adam and Eve lived in the garden. They saw everything about one another and they felt no shame. So why do, why do we have beautiful things that are broken? Why did shame come into the picture? Like, where does all that go? Well, that's just a teaser to get you to come back next week, because next week we're going to move into Genesis 3. It's a great question, and as you would hope, I have a few thoughts and a few things to say about that. But here's where I want to just stop, and here's where I want to press pause because I love for Job, in the midst of Job's questions, in the midst of all of his, God, where are you? What are you doing? Where did you go? God just takes Job back and says, listen, look back to how this all began. Look back. Because this was my intent. This is where it starts. It starts with, with, with my creation in relationship with me and shame never being part of the story. And maybe you find yourself today and you're questioning God. Maybe you find yourself today and everything in your world is just turned upside down. Listen to God say, just take a walk in the garden. Just walk back. You know, you can like go on walks and you can actually like leave your phone at home. It's the craziest thing. You probably won't travel far from your house, some of you. Maybe you can pace yourself and get a little bit farther away as the days go. There's something so beneficial about just taking a walk. There's something so beneficial about looking at the birds and hearing the sounds. There's something so beneficial about reconnecting to creation because this is the thumbprint of God. This is where God is. And God is not absent in the midst of your storm. Sometimes you just gotta look back to the beginning of the story to find the hope in today. God still spoke to Job in the storm. Even in a broken world where bad things happen to good people, even in a world where clearly evil does exist, God is still greater. And he's working in ways that we see and in ways that we don't. Um, as the band comes out, as I sort of wrap this up, I couldn't help but, but think as I'm, as I'm reading about Job and Job's story and God just taking him back to creation. This beautiful um, tradition, this custom, it's a Jewish tradition, it's called Shiva. And it's this moment where when someone loses someone who's close to them and, and they enter into this season of, of mourning, there's six days when they're in their house. This is Shiva, six days, and they mourn. And for six days, people, the community, the neighborhood, they come and they gather and they are a presence with those who are mourning, with those who are hurting. Some of us, we put so much pressure on ourselves when we see people hurting because we think we have to say just the right thing. You know what? Sometimes saying nothing is the right thing. Just being a presence with people who are hurting. Just standing there, just being a presence so they can see that they are not alone. 
And that's six days that the person just hangs out in the house. It's six days that, yes, you mourn. Yes, you grieve. But it's the seventh day. Someone actually wrote it as the seventh day is re-entering creation. And what happens on the seventh day that's different from the others is now it's time to walk outside the house, the neighborhood, the neighbors, the community, they gather, they come inside, they take the person who is grieving and they just take them on a walk. They walk out the front door and they walk around the block and there's silence, no words need to be spoken. All they need to see is this, that life goes on, that birds are singing, that the sun, it's rising, whether you can see it or whether you can't. And you have to keep walking too. God takes Job, he takes him on a walk through creation. He says, I know things seem so broken right now. Things seem so confusing right now, but I'm still here and I'm working. You gotta trust me. So may you today look back at how it began. I know we're not in the Garden of Eden, but I would still say we are in the garden. God's creation is breathtaking. God's beauty is surreal. David got lost in the wonder of the stars. Read Psalm 8 later today. May you look back and may you have hope today in knowing that, all right, God's still here. He's still got my story. He's still writing on the pages of my story. And may you believe that we're getting back to the garden. Community will rally. The church will win. Evil does not win. The light conquers evil every time. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God's people said, amen. Would you stand? I want to pray for you. Let me pray. God, I, uh, Father, I'm so thankful, um, my goodness, for this creation story that just caught me off guard this week. It's nothing I have to add flavor to. It's nothing I have to add any kind of spice to because, God, it's pretty amazing what you've done. It's pretty incredible what you're doing. So, Lord, I, I just, I, I pray over my friends this week. I pray over those. There's someone today, and they're just hurting. They're struggling, and I know it. I sense it met them and the pushback on this is to just think that that God you're a God of of wrath or, or you're a God who just doesn't care for your people but Lord I know this isn't who you are so I just pray you would loosen the grip of those things those lies that the enemy is telling us that we're holding on to loosen the grip father of our hearts so that we can freely open up our hands and just see you're still doing a good work trust you to believe in you so, Father, be glorified, be lifted up, be praised. And it's in your name that we say amen.